Day 17 in the Karen Reed trial is over, and we had Brian Higgins on the stand. Very interesting day, just as anticipated to hear the testimony from Brian Higgins. We're not even done yet. It seems that Mr. Jackson still has some more cross-examination to explore with Brian Higgins, and that's going to continue on Tuesday after Memorial Day. So we have plenty of time to digest what happened with Brian Higgins, think about the entire trial, and prepare for the next week, the upcoming week, of future testimony from the state in this case. So before I jump into the testimony and the substance of the testimony and the cross-examination and whether this helped any side one way or the other, I want to talk about two quick things. Number one, as I've spoken about before, it's very annoying watching this trial if you're trying to understand the basis for some of the objections and the basis for the rulings on some of, this, some of these objections. It's just frustrating. Even for a lawyer like me, I'm having trouble always trying to understand what the basis of different objections are and what the basis for the rulings are. And some rulings I don't understand, some objections I don't understand. And if I, would, if I was sitting there, I would, if I was one of the attorneys there, I'd be asking, Your Honor, I need to understand the basis for the objection. I want to understand the basis for your ruling on this objection because I have a question here that I want answered. And I want to make a record of it. And I don't know what type of sidebars they've had about this. They probably had some discussion on sidebar. But... I, we're not seeing any sort of record about what some of the basis of the objections are and what some of the basis of the rulings are, which can potentially hurt your client if you're going to appeal this case or whatever. So it's just in terms of appealing, that's number one. And in terms of just understanding for everybody else who's watching this trial, even as a trial lawyer, it's been a little bit difficult trying to understand exactly the basis for every single objection that are being made and what the basis for the rulings are. So that's number one. Number two I want to talk about uh, is... The fact that it's getting annoying every time can they, if when the attorneys ask, can I, may I approach? That's basic. You know, before uh, you approach a witness, certainly in criminal trials, you ask, can I approach the witness? And that's just to let the judge know what you want to do, and have everybody on on guard for what you're doing. You're approaching the witness. Um, I've had judges who have told us, the attorneys trying the case. And they told us beforehand, and this is not when anything's being recorded. I haven't had any of my trials publicized yet. But the judge will tell us, don't ask me for permission to approach the witness, okay? We're not scared of anything in this courtroom. We know what this case is about. You, no one's going to get into a brawl here. The deputies don't have to be on, on notice that you're approaching the witness. You can all approach the witness, okay? So don't waste our, my time and keep asking, may I approach the witness? So I've had that done, and we can see in this trial how it's a little annoying to continually hear, may I approach, may I approach, may I approach, may I approach the witness, back and forth the entire trial, and the judge just says yes anyway. So the judge is saying yes anyway. The judge should tell them on the sidebar, okay, guys, we're done with the asking. You're allowed to approach the witness. If there's a reason why you shouldn't, I'll have a sidebar before that witness or whatever. So it's just, again, a little bit of annoying watching this trial in that way. But everything else in this trial has been very interesting and exciting so far. So let's jump into the actual... Uh, substance of Brian Higgins. So first, he had direct examination by the state. So uh, Brian Higgins, as we've already heard some of the parts of his story already from other witnesses like Brian Albert. So uh, he was uh, at the funeral of a fallen, some fallen police officers in New York, and he flew in and then he drove back with Brian Albert and another friend of his, Eddie Hernandez. And uh, first, after the funeral, they uh, had to switch cars. He had to switch cars because he was in a, a police vehicle uh, and he wasn't able to be in that type of vehicle when he's going on his own personal uh, trips to the bar. And therefore, he had to switch vehicles at the Canton Police Department where his office was. Even though Brian Higgins is an ATF agent, he doesn't work for Canton Police Department, but he is very friendly and very close with Chief Berkowitz. And therefore, uh, they, J Chief Berkowitz allowed him to have an office in the Canton Police Department. Um, so they went to, then he went to the hillside. Uh, which is another establishment, as, we, as we've heard from prior testimony. And that's where he met, met Brian Albert there. They had some drinks, and he ate something. And then after that, Brian Albert left, went to the waterfall, and later Brian Higgins joined him at the waterfall, where we know eventually John O'Keefe and Karen Reed went, and Brian and Nicole Albert, and Matt and Jen McCabe, some other players in this trial, ended up there. And he acknowledged that Brian Albert is a good friend of his. So here we have a close connection between Brian Higgins and Brian Albert. He also knew John O'Keefe and Karen Reed for about a year before, and he was very friendly with John O'Keefe. He was a friend. He had John O'Keefe's cell phone number, and they used to text each other. 
he remembered that when Karen came into the waterfall, Karen Reed came into the waterfall, she pulled this glass out of her coat. And everybody understood that she really stole, quote unquote, stole this glass from uh, C.F. McCarthy's and brought it to the waterfall. And that's what everyone's testifying to. And what was inside the glass, the glass was had clear li liquid in it, which most likely was some sort of mix of uh, vodka and some other some other drink or maybe just straight vodka that's what the suggestion here is why would you be drinking why would you be bringing water <laughs> in a glass from cf mccarthy's to the waterfall so that is what i think everyone's understanding here all right now he didn't have any conversations with karen reed at the waterfall and that was clear from the surveillance he had no conversations with her and this is going to be a little bit more significant as we get into his testimony and cross-examination now he did text karen reed after the waterfall, um, well, and we're going to see again what the significance of that is. And why would you, why would he be texting Karen Reed um, well? Like, what are you trying to do with that type of text? And he acknowledged that it was more of a flirtatious text that he was texting to Karen Reed, which is a little bit sticky here because Karen Reed is officially the girlfriend of John O'Keefe, a longtime girlfriend, not just that they started and just started going out. She has been committed. Uh, I guess in that way, as a long-term girlfriend to John O'Keefe. And he did send this flirty text. Now, he said that the whole table was invited back to 34 Fairview. And again, we've been hearing a little bit of a conflict about exactly how that invitation came about. But that was his testimony that the whole table was invited back to 34 Fair Fairview. And he actually got to 34 Fairview first. So Brian Higgins was the first one to get to 34 Fairview from the entire party that was at the waterfall and when he was there he had a jeep and he had a plow attached to the front of his jeep and what he did was even though there was a very very small dusting of snow on the ground at that point he still plowed the driveway and he said that he did this because he was being a smart ass and somehow that was i guess funny or being a smart ass is some way by plowing the driveway and it doesn't need to be plowed. I didn't understand that really. Maybe you can all explain to me why that is being so witty or smart by or funny by doing that. I didn't understand that really. All right. Now he gets in. So eventually uh, Brian and Nicole Albert show up and he comes into the house at 34 Fairview and he was asked, where were you hanging out? He's hanging out mostly in the kitchen. And that's been mostly the testimony from everybody so far. They're all hanging out in the kitchen. There was some music. There were some beers being passed around and more drinking. Now, remember that there was a time where Brian Albert and Brian Higgins left the kitchen. And the testimony has been so far from different people, Brian Albert for sure, that they went to look at pictures of Brian Albert's son who's in the Marine Corps. And Brian Higgins himself was in the Marine Corps himself. And that is why they wanted to, she, Brian Albert thought that it would be interesting to Brian Higgins to see some of those pictures. Now, he left the house between 1230 and 1 o'clock in the morning. He was one of the first ones to leave. Uh, I think he was the first one to leave, uh, unless you start counting Colin Albert. And the reason why he left early is because they only had beer to drink. He's not a beer drinker, and he knew right away that this was going to be a short night at the Albert House because he didn't really have anything to drink with everybody else. Now, he testified that he never went upstairs, and this is also significant because Brian Albert testified that they did go upstairs to look at these pictures. Um, he said that he only saw one person leave the house, and that would be Julie Nagel, but as we know, Julie Nagel actually came back into the house. So he saw Julie Nagel leave, and then Julie Nagel must have come back into the house. But that was the only person that he ever say, saw leave the house. Now, what about Colin Albert? He says he doesn't remember ever being introduced to Colin Albert, and he doesn't remember ever seeing Colin Albert. And this is also very interesting because he was the first one at the house. And Brian and Nicole Albert both said that they did bump into Colin Albert as he was leaving. So Colin Albert was leaving when Brian and Nicole were there, and Brian and Nicole came after Brian Higgins. So therefore, you would think, you would assume, that Brian Higgins did have some sort of interaction with Colin Albert, and he's claiming that he doesn't recall any sort of interaction. Now, it's possible that he just doesn't remember it because it was so brief. But 
That is what his testimony was. He also testified that John O'Keefe and Karen Reed never came into the house. And he texted John at 1220 in the morning, are you coming here? With no response. Now, when he left, he left the house between, he wants to put it between 1230 and one o'clock in the morning. When he left, he didn't see any vehicles or any body. So if Karen Reed's vehicle was not there, and the state's case is that that was the time, if her vehicle was not there, that means that he was, John O'Keefe was already hit by Karen Reed and left to die in the snow. Um, Brian Higgins potentially could have seen him on the front lawn, yet he testified that he did not see anybody on the lawn. Now, what did he do after he left 34 Fairview? It's been a very long day. He testified about that a number of times. It was a long day. He was at the funeral and he drove back and then he was at the hillside and then he was at the waterfall and then he was at the Albert's house. But what did he decide to do? He went, decided to go to the Canton Police Department where his office is. And his testimony was that the reason that he went there was because he had to move some vehicles because he knew that there was a, there was a blizzard coming in and Chief Berkowitz always asked him that uh, if there's a blizzard coming in, that he should keep his vehicles in the center of the parking lot so that it'll allow for the plows to plow the parking lot. So he initially, this is what his testimony was, he initially left the key or the keys to the vehicles that needed to be moved on his desk so that someone else can move them if necessary as this blizzard is coming in. And one of the reasons that he left the keys there was because he anticipated actually staying overnight when he left for the funeral. That is what his testimony was. But then he decided that he wanted to come back before the blizzard came in. So initially he thought he was going to stay overnight. Then he decided no, he's going to come back. Uh, and now that he's back, so obviously he's the one that has to go and move the vehicles. Now he said the following. He said, I had to go move the vehicles that night because if he didn't move the vehicles that night, he would have to get up early to move them. And also they plow through the night. This is what he said. So putting these two things together is difficult to understand because what does it mean you're going to wake up early? If they plow through the night, it's already 1 o'clock in the morning. Right? If it's 1 o'clock in the morning, what are you going to do? Go to sleep for an hour and a half and then come back? Like That makes no sense. If they plow through the night, they may be coming in a half hour or an hour or two hours. So what are you going to do? Go home and wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning? That doesn't make so much sense. But yet he said he, he would have to wake up early if he didn't go that night to move the vehicles. So that doesn't make sense, and if, if certainly if they plow through the night. So he had to go then. That's essentially what his testimony was. He had to go then. All right. So the normal route into the Canton Police Department is through the Sally Port because we're going to be seeing some access. Uh, everybody has a key card there, obviously, and uh, Brian Higgins' key card is registering at the Sally Port, that he's using the Sally Port entrance uh, into the police department, and what's he doing in the Sally Port? And that's exactly where Karen Reed's vehicle ends up. So what's he doing there? Well, his answer to that was that's the normal way that everybody comes in to the police department. They go through the Sally Port. And there's other entrances also, but I guess as police officers, it's a normal way to enter the police, the Canton Police Department is through the Sally Port. Now, eventually he went home. And what did he do at home? He ate and he drank. He ate some more, drank some more. And then he went to sleep. And his testimony was that he either slept on the couch or his bed. And this was interesting because it was brought out on cross-examination uh, that the first time he ever said that he may have slept on the couch is during this trial. Until now, he never testified that he may have fallen asleep on the couch. He always testified that he went to sleep in his bed and he put his phones on the nightstand next to his bed. His testimony was he did not have any phone calls with Brian Albert at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we're going to see more about this coming up. But we've heard, we've heard already from Brian Albert's testimony uh, with cross-examination that they do have some records that show that some phone calls were made between Brian Albert and Brian Higgins at around 2 o'clock in the morning. And we've heard about the pocket dials or butt dials on those phone calls. But Brian Higgins' testimony was that there was no conversation at all. He never called Brian Albert, never answered Brian Albert's phone calls until the next morning around 6.30 in the morning when he got a call from, uh, he got received calls from both Chief Berkowitz and Brian Albert. Now he answered Brian Albert's phone first, uh, and then he was at that time allegedly told that 
uh, about this, uh, the death of John O'Keefe, and he immediately went to 34 Fairview in his Jeep. He doesn't remember where he parked when he got to 34 Fairview the next morning, and everyone that was there was very distraught and sad. Everybody was shocked. Everyone trying to figure out what exactly happened. How did this happen? And he was asked, what was, what was your reaction? And his, he, Ryan Higgins responded that his reaction was that nothing made sense to him because he knew that John and Karen never showed up to 34 Fairview. But all he knew was that maybe they were going to come. And he texted John, are you coming? But his testimony was that they never showed up. So how did he end up dead on the front lawn? So it was very confusing to him how this even happened. Now, the next part, his testimony was that he either went home after that morning visit with everybody, so either he went home or he went to Canton Police Department, he doesn't remember. And this is going to be interesting on cross-examination, which we're going to get to soon. But that was his testimony on direct. But he doesn't remember exactly where he went after that morning rendezvous at 34 Fairview. Now, he was asked, well, if you did go to the police station, why would you have gone to the police station? And his answer was, well, I just, I was in shock. I wanted to start putting things together. I wanted to think about things. And why would you need to do that at the police department? He lives by himself at home. He can do that at home. He can do that in his car. He can drive around. He can take a walk. He can, he can go home. Why does he need to do that in his office in the Canton Police Department? That is not clear. But that's what his testimony was. But certainly at some point, uh, he was, he did testify that he was at the police department at some point. So again, it doesn't sound like he spent a lot of the day, day there. It just sounds like, yeah, at some point I was there, but I don't remember. I may have gone to the police department. I may have gone home first. I'm not sure. But at some point I did go to the police, uh, police department. And if I did, it was because I just wanted to put things together in my head. Now, on February 3rd, a few days later, he met with Trooper Proctor. And he volunteered and provided his text messages which he, uh, which, he, which he wrote to John O'Keefe and Karen Reed. So he had text messages, uh, a thread between himself and John O'Keefe, which he himself took on, a, on his own initiative to extract and hand over to the police and uh, uh, to, the, uh, to Michael uh, Trooper Proctor. And then he also handed over his, um, his threads with Karen Reed. Now, January, it's either 16th or 15th. January 15th was actually a Saturday, and I think they got a, kind of got the dates here mixed up because uh, January 15th of 2022 is when the Patriots were playing against the Bills, and uh, that was a Saturday. January 16th was a Sunday. I think they mix this up. Normally, they, normally you play on Sunday, but that time was a uh, wild, card, wild card playoff game, and they were actually playing on Saturday. So... On that day, January 15th, but they, I think they keep saying 16th, he was invited over to watch the Patriots game at John's house. Uh, and he was, asked, um, he was asked by John also, and he was also asked by Karen, that he was invited by both of them to come hang out with them, watch the game, the Patriots game, and just hang out, have a good time. So he, uh, he did arrive at the end of the game, initially – didn't seem like he was so excited to come, but he did eventually come, and uh, he did play video games with Patrick. Patrick was his uh, John O'Keefe's nephew, who he was taking care of. And now we get into the text messages, and the text messages are very interesting between um, Brian Higgins and Karen Reed. And I'm sure a lot of people are talking about these text messages. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on it because I think – uh, they speak for themselves, and we're just going to give some observations of these text messages and what I think these text messages are really showing about the relationship between Karen Reed and Brian Higgins. And, of course, everyone's welcome to comment on your own about what you think these text messages say. Again, I am not an expert in relationships, um, and um, but I have had some experience with text messages in other trials. I've seen a lot of text message exchanges with, between two parties, <laughs> two parties uh, that are either having a relationship or having an affair. And um, therefore, that's where my thoughts and observations are coming from. So here we go on January 12th. I'm going to start with January 12th. This is where Karen texts, hey, Brian, it's the weed whacker. So Karen took the initiative to get Brian Higgins 
cell phone number. So she is the instigator. She is opening up this line of communication with Brian Higgins. That's, there's no question about that. So she is the one instigating this all of this. Now, remember, January 12th was only a few days after the whole incident in Aruba. Let's, let's keep that in mind, right? So we had this incident with Aruba. Karen Reed was under the impression that John O'Keefe was doing more than just a friendly hug to Marietta Sullivan, right? We've heard about this from previous testimony. So this is just a few days later. So exactly what her emotional state was at that point is we can, we can make some educated guesses from the fact that she just went through this incident in Aruba. Whether she was right about it or not, still her emotional state is what it is. So she reaches out to Brian Higgins and she says, hey, Brian, it's the weed whacker. And Brian Higgins responds as question mark, like who in the world is this? And and then there's a picture of, uh, of some Smirnoff ice bottles. And the nickname Weed Whacker came from the time that they, uh, Karen was outside John's house and she was weed whacking. She was taking care of some of the landscaping and she was weed whacking. And he drove by, he gave a beep, and she just thought it was some guy beeping at, a, at her. Maybe she's had that experience in the past. And um, she, she gave him the finger, whoever it was. Um, and he came back around to show who it was. And uh, she still didn't realize who it was, and she called out some, some uh, curse word to him, you know, stay away from me, my husband is a Boston police officer. And once she, once she actually realized, oh, this is Brian Higgins, and they've, they did have some interactions before, so then it was obviously all cool. So that was why she was saying it's the weed whacker. You know? Now, that, was started, that started on January 12th. January 13th, it continues the following. She discusses with him that they're going on vacation. Uh, John and Karen are uh, working on going on vacation with another couple, the current couple. And she invited him to come join them. Now, it's, again, it's an interesting invite. You have two couples going, and then we're going to have this single guy coming with us. But, okay, you know, I guess it can be understood if they're all friends, that they can all hang out together on vacation. Or maybe he can bring uh, a girlfriend with him or whatever. So um, then... She also invites him to come that Saturday. I mean, that Saturday was to come hang out with uh, John and Karen, watch the Patriots game, and with this other couple. He said no because he doesn't want to intrude on couples' nights. And it was kind of said in a, in a joking type of way, no, I'm not going to intrude on your guys and your couples' nights together. I'm just a single guy. I'm not going to intrude on that. It's not like an open party to all of our friends or everybody on the block. It's you, you two couples are getting together, having couples' nights. So, you know, what's a single guy going to do? I'm just going to be shy. I'm going to be weird. So I'm just not coming over. And then she started saying certain things, which also can kind of show her mindset. She said, well, most couples don't even like each other. And they like to hang out with their single friends. They'd rather hang out with their non-couple friends. So that's where you were first starting to see, oh, most couples don't even like each other. Why are you saying it that type of way? Obviously, you're telling us that you yourself are included in that category of most couples. And therefore, you're kind of saying that you and John are not so happy with each other right now. Now, January 15th, and again, I think I got all these dates right. They were jumping around in the different text messages, and I was trying to keep track of the different uh, dates that they were talking about, um, but uh, they were jumping around. So I may have some of the dates here messed up. But from what I can tell, January 15th, when Karen texts Brian Higgins, and Karen texts him, you're hot, okay? And his response is, are you serious or messing with me? And then she responds, no, I'm serious. And then he responds, feeling is mutual, is that bad? How long have you thought that? And Karen, res Karen responds, again, seems like a little bit sometime later, or this is just the text message that they pulled up because they didn't go through every single text message uh, that they've exchanged with each other. So they were, they were jumping around. So, um, but Brian Higgins did respond, the feeling is mutual. How long have you, had the, have you had those feelings for? And then some point later, Karen responds back to him, are you okay driving? And this seems to be after he came over to at the end of the Patriots game to hang out with uh, with them and he was playing uh, video games with Patrick so Karen seemed to text him are you okay dri driving you don't want to stay here question mark and he responded I'm fine I have an office at, at the p uh, police department you didn't answer the question and then Karen responded rather you stay here now he eventually decides to leave as he probably should he shouldn't be staying at their house so he's leaving 
And before he leaves, John was in the restroom. So John was in the restroom, and Karen decides that he's gonna, she's going to walk out Brian Higgins. And at some point, he was actually heading towards one exit of the house, and Karen tells him to go out a different exit. And as they're leaving the, ex- after, as they're leaving the house and she's walking him out, she kisses him. And his testimony was, and we're going to hear a little bit more about this kiss, exactly what it was, but his testimony was it was not a friendly kiss. Okay, It's not like you're just peck that you give to somebody who's a friend on the cheek or something. This was a kiss on the lips. We're going to hear more about this as the testimony comes out. Now, he, at some point, they go back to the text messages between Karen and Brian Higgins when they're trying to figure out what exactly Karen wants. So Brian Higgins responds, I wish, I think you're messing with me. And then Karen says, why do you think that? Meaning, why do you think that I'm messing with you? I'm saying you're hot. I'm attracted to you. And Brian Higgins responds, because this is so out of left field, where do these feelings come from? Karen responds, I just think you're like me. And Brian Higgins responds, meaning? And Karen says, well, do you, have, do you have your own kids? And he responds, I have no kids. How am I like you? Um, hello. And she's not responding right away, so he keeps texting her. I have no kids. How am I like you? So obviously, right, obviously, I, we're also going to see, by the way, we're also going to see how sometimes how you see that uh, men don't really understand women and women are trying to give a certain message to men and they're not getting it and they're just using hints and men aren't understanding and they just want things to be direct and straight out and women don't always work that way. But you're seeing that also from the text messages, which I thought was interesting because it's not just in one relationship you find this all the time. Men want the women to be much more direct and the women feel uncomfortable being direct and therefore they're kind of beating around the bush a little bit more and just using hints. Um, Anyway, so Karen says, do you have your own kids? And he says, no. And then he continues to ask, how am I like you? Well, obviously, that's number one, is that she's saying we both don't have kids, and that's obviously a conscious decision. She doesn't want kids, and she's going to continue saying that. And you don't have kids probably because you don't want kids, right? So we're kind of alike in that way, right? We, we like to be not tied down to those type of responsibilities. We want to be free, I guess, and enjoy life. So although I'll tell you that the most enjoyment comes from having kids. Okay, but that's my own personal opinion. All right, let's move on. So Karen says aren't we alike? And Brian Higgins says, I think so. And then Brian Higgins responds, okay, so why did you get my number and reach out to me? And Karen responds by putting a question mark on the bubble. Like, why did you, why did you, why did I get my number and reach out to you? I just basically told you, right? But again, she's not coming out and saying it directly. And some men want the women to be direct with them. So, so Brian Higgins continues, I asked a bunch of times, why did you reach out to me? And this continues to go on. Like, he keeps asking, why did you reach out to me? What do you want from me? He keeps asking that question. Now, Karen responds at some point, I was basically begging you, meaning to come over on Saturday. And Brian Higgins responds, you don't have to beg me. I will give you whatever you want. Interesting way that he phrased that. And he continues asking, what does she want? And... It's not clear exactly how Karen's responding to that. Now Karen finally responds, we're single, we don't have kids, we can do whatever we want. So again, trying to show him, we're single, we don't have kids, we're alike, in that way, you think I'm hot, I think you're hot, we can do whatever we want. What do you think she's saying? I mean, do you have to be a rocket scientist? Do you have to be like a relationship coach to be able to explain to Brian Higgins what exactly she's trying to tell him? I mean, to me, it seems pretty obvious, but maybe that's just me. All right. So later on, Karen responds, do you like me? And Brian Higgins responds, yes, clearly. And then Karen says, come over to my house. And Brian Higgins says, when? When should I come over to your house? And Karen says, well, when works for you? And Brian Higgins responds, whenever. When works for you? And Karen said, I asked you first. And Brian Higgins says, I think you're messing with me. So I don't know if he's serious at this point, but I think Karen's pretty much showed her hand. She's not messing with him. But he keeps saying, I think you're messing with me. Probably because he wants a direct, much for which he wants her, he wants her to be much more direct with him and say, I want you to come over because I want to spend the night with you. But women don't always talk that way. So she's not doing that. So um, 
Then Karen responds, I'm glad you came over tonight. And Brian responds, me too. And then Brian Higgins responds, are you glad you walked me out? So here's some more flirtatious talk. And Karen responds, um, dot, 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 yes, with a smiley face. Are you? Meaning, are you happy that I walked you out? And Brian Higgins responds, definitely. And then at some point later, Karen responds, we kissed, right? And Brian Higgins responds, is this a trick question? Well, because obviously they kissed. Well, why do you think Karen's bringing it up? Because she wants to continue with this whole line. Um, and then he asks again, why did you reach out to me? And then again, she said, because I think you're like me and I'm attracted to you, period, a lot. So she's basically showing him, I'm very attracted to you. We kissed, right? Wink, wink, we kissed. I'm very attracted to you. I like you. And then Brian Higgins responds, feeling is mutual. And then he just says, I just never saw this coming. And then Karen said, why? And then Brian Higgins responds, because I just assumed you were happy with your situation. Meaning her situation with John and the kids. And then Karen responds, I was, but things have deteriorated. So now we're seeing, oh, okay, she's kind of showing that things have deteriorated. Not exactly toxic, as the prosecution is going to probably be arguing to the jury, but things have deteriorated in their relationship. And remember, remember the time frame, because the time frame is important in this thing. So this is a, literally a week or two after Aruba, that whole situation. They probably had a few discussions about that. And she explains to Brian Higgins the situation with John, what she calls hooking up with Marietta Sullivan. Um, and then, again, at some point, Karen now flips the, t flips the script. And Karen says, says to Brian Higgins, what do you want from me? And Brian Higgins responds, what's on the table? And Karen responds, what do you want ideally? And Brian Higgins responds, the real deal. To which Karen responds, doesn't exist. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear at this point that Karen is not interested in a real relationship with Brian Higgins. I think that's pretty clear from these, this, this exchange right here. What do you want ideally? The real deal. What do you mean the real deal? The real deal means that we're really going to be boyfriend, girlfriend. We're going to be committed to each other. We're going to have a relationship, like a real relationship. And she says it doesn't exist. First meaning it's not, it's not going to happen. That's not what I'm interested in. Now, sometime later, Karen responds, and I never wanted kids. And she talks about uh, venting about her situation and how complicated it is with the kids, and John's heart is not in it, and it's not really John's not really cut out to do all this uh, parenting with his two kids, and his, and and he's not really so excited about doing it. He was just very close with his sister, which is why he took these two kids in um, to raise them. And she also vents about John cheating on her, and then at some point uh, she offers to go out with drinks with him, and she talks about how John uh, saw the ring cameras the w where she was walking him out and. And John said, are you hooking up with Brian Higgins as more of a joke? And then Brian gets very scared that maybe this is actually, they actually were caught kissing uh, by the ring camera. And she says, no, don't worry. Uh, it was, I know where the cameras pick up and where the cameras don't pick up. And that's obviously why she diverted him away from the exit that he was going to go to in order to kiss him when she was, when he was going out a different exit, right? So that's pretty obvious. And then Karen responds the following. She says, it was a peck anyway. I kissed Carrie and gay Jeff too. So here, this is Karen responding, saying, eh, it wasn't really a kiss anyway. So what's she doing here? Now she's trying to play down the kiss. And then Brian Higgins responds, yeah, weak, I agree. So he's also now saying that that kiss was weak. So again, this was a kiss on the lips. So it's not a friendly kiss. It's more than just a friendly kiss that you kiss someone you're, your uh, friend or neighbor or whatever that you're friendly with. It's obviously more than that. But it wasn't a long, drawn-out kiss either, it seems like. So what she's calling a peck, what she's saying is weak. And then they actually talk about John. And Brian Higgins says, I think he's a good dude too. They're talking about John. And because Karen was saying how John likes Brian Higgins, and he's saying the more that I hang out with him, the more I like him. And here's Brian Higgins saying, yeah, I think John's a good, good guy. He's a good dude. And Karen responding, yes, he is. 
So this is not Karen completely disparaging John and saying, I can't stand this guy. I just kind of want to get out of this relationship and uh, he drives me crazy and insane. It doesn't seem that that's how Karen's feeling about John. She's saying that he's a good guy. And then they talk about that invitation that Karen really invited Brian Higgins to come over to her house. And Brian Higgins responds, coming to your house would have been a bad for both of us. For starters, you wouldn't have wanted me to leave. And then Karen says, that sounds good. And Brian Higgins responds, that's trouble. Karen, why? Brian Higgins, nice try. You don't think if I came over for a drink, we would have got carried away. Karen said, you said you were adaptable and tons of fun. I took that as an invite for an invite. So Karen was saying to Brian Higgins, you told me you're adaptable. You told me you're tons of fun. So you're basically telling me, hey, you don't mind just hooking up. And that's why I took that as an invite. I took that as an invite to invite you, meaning you're opening the door saying, hey, I'm tons of fun. Just mention the word and I'm there. It's essentially what she understood it to be. And therefore, Karen said, okay, I'm game. Come on over. And Brian Higgins says, oh, okay. And then Karen responds the following. I'm 42. I know what happens when you invite someone over for a drink. So again, Karen saying, yes, I understood exactly what I was doing and you just didn't show up. And then Karen says, I've been through a lot of my life. I have a little bit of carpe diem mindset. Karen said, I'm pretty sure we would have hooked up. Okay, and then she tries to explain that, uh, that they're really all single. John's single. She's single. They're just dating. You know, it's different than when, when you're actually married to somebody uh, than to just go out and, I guess, hook up with other people. And she's trying to explain this, the, the, that idea that it's different, the fact that her and John are just dating and uh, they're all really all technically single. So what I think, to me, what this looks like is Karen was in a very fragile emotional state after what happened with Aruba, whether it was whether she was right about it or not. She w had em an emotionally charged event and she was fragile. And for whatever reason, she wanted to hook up with Brian Higgins. Now, was it in revenge, like revenge against John because she felt that John was cheating on her? Or was it because she just was needed a break from her situation with the kids, with John and everything that's going on in that. I don't know. But what it seems to me, and again, you can all, and I'm not a relationship expert, but what it seems to me is that she wanted to hook up with him like a one night stand. I don't know, maybe a little bit more. And then that's it. She didn't want anything more serious. She didn't want this affair to go on. She didn't want it to be like something that's going to be drawn out. Maybe it would have, maybe it could have, but from these text, me text messages exchanges, to me, it seems like she wasn't interested. It doesn't exist. You want a real deal. You want me to be your girlfriend. That's not going to happen. And I'm open to hooking up because I'm single and and this is how I, you know, this is how I am. I'm carpe diem. I'm going through a lot. I'm just happy to, to hook up, get a change of scenery. But nothing more than that. And for all of you trial watchers who have seen this type of these type of text messages, you've probably seen when you, you have an affair going on in a different, mur which eventually leads to a murder. And I think this is how the prosecutor is going to try to play this. That look, John, uh, Karen was very unhappy with John and she was about to have an affair with Brian Higgins and she was looking elsewhere. Um, it's different. You know, when you have uh, from, again, from the, your, your, all my experienced trial watchers, when you watch some of these other trials, the affair is going on for months. They're texting each other all the time. And not only that, but they're disparaging on their partners. They're disparaging on their husbands or wives or whatever it is. And they're just saying how they want to get out of this and they want to take care of problems. And, and they have to, you know, they're maybe they're not talking straight out about it. But the point is that it's going on for months. They want to be together. They only want to be with each other. And therefore, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get there. That doesn't seem the way that these text messages read, at least to me. Yes, it was inappropriate. Yes, it's cheating. Brian Higgins wasn't appropriate. Karen was inappropriate. You can explain it or you try to explain it. I don't care. That doesn't, that doesn't, what, what, what eventually what this comes down to is, are these text messages a reason that Karen Reed wanted to go and knock off John because she wanted to be with Brian Higgins? And to me, it doesn't seem that way. It seems that she wanted to say, have something fun, something fun on the, on the side. She wanted to have a little hookup with Brian Higgins and that's it. That's what it seems like to me. So, um, that's what I see from these text messages. All right, so moving on to cross-examination. So now let's go to cross-examination. 
So first thing Alan Jackson brought out was that Brian Higgins brought an attorney to court today. And he thought that he was actually sitting in the gallery, but he wasn't. And he was talking to him about why he brought an attorney to, to court that was objected to. It wasn't answered. And they, he said that he did speak to Mr. Lally, the prosecutor. Brian Higgins spoke to Mr. Lally on Monday in person. And then he gets into about how violent Brian Albert is. So again, this is Brian Higgins on the stand, who's very close with Brian Albert, and he talks to Brian Higgins about how, how uh, violent Brian Albert is. And he said, in fact, well, actually, I'm sorry, before we get into that, first he talks about Chief Berkowitz. And Chief Berkowitz had a retirement, and because Chief Berkowitz is so close to Brian Higgins, Brian Higgins had a, set a toast for him at his retirement, and he said something to the effect that if you want to hide a body, Chief Berkowitz is your man. Now, of course, he was obviously not serious about saying that. He was saying it as more of a joke, but the insinuation there is, is still that Chief Berkowitz is the type of guy that can do that. And obviously, he's trying to bring that, how that's relevant over here, that everyone's trying to cover their tracks here. Now, he gets into the Brian Albert being uh, a violent person. And he says, and again, that, by the way, that question was objected to, and it was sustained. And then it doesn't matter. The jury heard it. And uh, then you get into Brian Albert, that Brian Albert had a, uh, some sort of altercation with Eddie Hernandez, was the, which was the other guy in the car. And they had some sort of altercation. And you even said, Brian Higgins even said that Chief Berkowitz is slightly afraid of Brian Albert. Now, moving on, he got out of Brian Higgins that he had about four uh, Irish whiskeys, Jameson and Ginger. Uh, and then he still, after having those four drinks, drove his vehicle to the waterfall. And he said that Brian also probably had more drinks than he did. So they're both driving, essentially drunk, to waterfall. And then he goes back to the text messages. And he brought out a very good pointer with K between Karen Reed and Brian Higgins. And he brought out that the last text, really, the, the, uh, the substance of the text only lasted about nine days between the two of them. It wasn't an extensive amount of time. It wasn't like an ongoing affair, which we find in a lot of other murder trials. This was just seems to be like a hookup that they wanted to, that Karen wanted, for whatever reason. Maybe because of her emotionally fragile state, or for whatever, maybe she's a terrible person. doesn't matter. She, it seems that that was the, that was the uh, tone of the text messages. And he's bringing out how this can be frustrating for you because you want her, you think she's hot, you want a real relationship with her, and she's not interested. And in fact, you said you wanted the real deal, and she responded, it doesn't exist. And one time, even in the text messages, she, uh, you asked her, what do you want from me? And she said, I don't even know. I don't know what I want from you. So it wasn't always clear what she wants from you. She also never expressed anything negative about John, John O'Keefe himself. In fact, we saw just the opposite, that he said that she said that he was a good guy, so he brought this up on cross-examination. And then she ghosts you on the 23rd. The last text of substance was January 23rd. That's almost a week before John O'Keefe was found dead. So she ghosts you, and he tries to bring out, now that can be very upsetting to you, because here you are, you're all excited, you're about to... You're, you're, you're engaging with this very hot girl in your mind. And even though she's your John O'Keefe's, fr your friend's girlfriend, but it's not stopping you. You're single and, you know, maybe you're open to that idea. And she goes to you January 23rd. You don't, you don't hear anything from her. So there was also a time where he told his supervisor about kissing Karen. So he's trying to show that this is obviously on your mind. You're talking to people about it. And he asks him if he ever told Brian Albert about it. And he, and Brian Higgins says, no, he never spoke to Brian Albert about it. And he's like, are you telling me that all that time together, your good friend, Brian Albert, your really good friend, you never spoke to him once about your kiss with Karen Reed, your interest in Karen Reed, uh, her interest in you. You didn't speak about this at all with your really good friend, Brian Albert. And his response was, no, he never spoke about it. Also, what's interesting is that at the waterfall, we see that this is already about a week after your last text of substance. You obviously are still thinking about her. And he tried to play it down. Like, nah, I was just, 
you know, it was regular for me. I was like, yeah, I was attracted to her, but nothing like crazy. And she comes into the waterfall and never even acknowledges you. She completely ignores you. She goes to talk to Jennifer McCabe and the other girls at the end of the bar or other men, and she's not even talking to you. That's got to hurt. And isn't that why you texted her after the waterfall? Um, well, because in your mind, you guys are still like flirting with each other and, and testing out maybe if you want to hook up or something. And she ignores you. And then you only text John O'Keefe if he's coming to 34 Fairview. You didn't text Karen Reed if she's coming. If you have this old little bit of a secret, cute relationship, why won't you text Karen? Hey, you coming to 34 Fairview? Want to see you? I haven't seen you in a while. Or even if not, why not text Karen Reed also? You only text John. And this is also some of the suggestion here is that they wanted John to be separate from Karen. That was part of the what the defense is making a case about. Also, you did testify previously that you never went upstairs. So here we have Brian Higgins saying he never went upstairs at 34 Fairview. Now, Brian Albert said that you did go upstairs to look at photos of Brian's son, who's in the Marine Corps. And what Alan Jackson tries to do here is he tries to say, well, hold on a second. If you're saying that you never went upstairs to the bedroom area, and Brian Albert is saying that you did go upstairs to look at stuff, well, where would Brian be in order to have to say that you go upstairs to the first floor? Because according to you, Brian Higgins, you never went to the second floor. You were only on the first floor. And if Brian Albert says you went upstairs, that means that you were in the basement, right? So he was trying to spin some of that into this. Now here's also something, a very interesting point, point that came out. On June 1st, 2023, which is the federal grand jury where Brian Higgins was, he testified that he believed a tall, dark, heared male came into the house. And he said, and then he tries to explain the testimony. He says, well, I didn't say that a tall, dark, haired male came into the house that wasn't part of the original group. I said they might have. And then he tries to also explain that, that he was saying that, Brian Higgins was saying that, testifying to that in the federal grand jury proceeding, in reference to someone's brother, meaning Julie Nagel's brother, coming into the house, right? So that's what it was in reference to. It wasn't in reference to some stranger or some other guy who can be 6'2", who John O'Keefe's built. That's, that's not what I was saying. I wasn't suggesting that. I was just suggesting that it could have been someone coming to pick up Julie Nagel which would be Ryan Nagel or Ryan Nagel's friend, right, who did come to the house at some point. And he also said that that person, this is what his testimony was, Brian Higgins, that that person who may have came into the house also may have had a conversation with the two other girls there and that it was a quick conversation. Now, number one, Alan Jackson wrote out, is that you never mentioned that in your interview with the state police that anybody came into the house, this random 6'2", tall, dark, not 6'2", tall, dark-haired male came into the house. You never mentioned that in the state police interview, and you never mentioned that in your straight, in the state grand jury proceedings. Only in this other proceeding, which we know to be the federal grand jury proceedings, did you mention that. And this is why this is starting to look bad for the state. And the reason is, is that everyone else has testified so far that nobody else came into the house. No one came in. Right? And the only testimony has been that Ryan Nagel and his friend in the F-150 came to pick up Julie Nagel, Ryan's sister, from the party because she texted him to come. No one has testified that he came into the house or may have come into the house. What does it mean that maybe the guy came into the house? What is your recollection that night? Was your recollection that someone may have come into the house? That's not something that you you're not sure about. Oh, maybe somebody came into the house. That's something that you would remember. And maybe he had a conversation with two girls in the kitchen in front of your face. That may have happened. You're not 100% sure. And everybody else has testified that that person never came into the house. So it seems that they got the, me the stories here messed up. That's why this is starting to smell. It's starting to stink a little bit. With this testimony that came up from Brian Higgins, that this random guy who he's now trying to say is, is Ryan Nagel or Ryan Nagel's friend, who came into the house, but he doesn't remember 100% whether he came in or not, That's it's starting to smell a little bit. 
And again, I'm not taking sides. I'm just telling you from in concert with all the other testimony that's that's come in so far about Ryan Nagel not coming into the house. It's strange that Brian Higgins would say, well, maybe he came into the house. That's not something that you would think someone would forget and 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 uh, say maybe he did, maybe he didn't. All right. Now, he said that he stayed there. Brian Higgins stayed in 34 Fairview for about a half hour, and he didn't say goodbye to anyone. He made a beeline out of there. You know, and then his testimony during trial was, well, I didn't make a beeline out of there. I did kind of like just say, okay, goodbye, I'm going. And then whether you anybody acknowledged that you're leaving or not, that wasn't clear. But he did say at the trial that, no, nah, I did say goodbye, everybody, I'm leaving. But it seems from another uh, testimony he said that he made a beeline out of there and he, that he didn't say goodbye to anyone. And as he's leaving, like he testified before, he didn't notice any, anybody on the lawn, uh, any body on the lawn, certainly not John O'Keefe's body. And he keeps saying, I wish I would have. This is what everybody keeps saying. Um, or when he got into his Jeep, which was parked right in front of the mailbox. So he gets into his Jeep, 1230, between 1230 and 1 o'clock in the morning. Karen Reed's car is not there, which means that she must have killed John O'Keefe already. And the body's lying there on the front lawn. And it's right near the flagpole, which Brian Higgins says is, if he's looking straight ahead, it's 12 o'clock. This is 1 o'clock. So it's directly over from his direct line of sight. It's not even like at 3 o'clock, which is great peripheral vision. This is 1 o'clock on the clock, which is how he explained the flagpole is. And he didn't see anybody there. Now, another thing that Alan Jackson brought out was that on February 3rd, 2022, is when he went to the Canton PD after, I'm sorry, on February in that, in that interview, on February 3rd, 2022, he said that he went to the Canton Police Department after leaving 34 Fairview to fulfill administrative obligations. So this is the night. He's talking about the night. When he left at 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, he didn't see anybody there. Where did he go? He went to the Canton Police Department to what? Fulfill administrative obligations. That's how he coined this term. And Alan Jackson said, F administrative obligations? What is that? You didn't go there for to fulfill administrative obligations. You went there to move cars. right? You wanted to just move your car to the middle of the parking lot so that you won't block the plows. That's what your testimony was, right? And now you're calling that administrative obligations? And his response to that was, yeah, that's what I call administrative obligations. That's what he calls administrative obligations, moving the car. I'm not sure if everybody would refer to that as administrative obligations. I think people would refer to that as, yeah, I just have to move my car. All right. Now, another thing that he pointed out, Alan Jackson, is that you went back to the Canton Police Department to switch cars after you came back from the funeral, before you went to the hillside. So it's already getting late at night. You know you're going to have to move your cars at some point. The reason why you came back is because there's a blizzard. You know a blizzard's coming. You're at the Canton Police Department. You're switching cars. Why wouldn't you just park the cars or switch the cars right then when you're at the Canton Police Department? Why would you wait to 1 o'clock in the morning to have to go back to Canton Police Department to move your car special, make a special trip out of it? You're there anyway. And that's a decent point that he brought out. And his response is that, well, I was really hungry and I had a long day. I just wanted to get out of there. I wanted to go eat at the hillside. I wanted to get, have a few drinks. And I'd worry about it later, which is just not the greatest excuse. Just not. All right. Now, he also testified that he never received or made any phone calls after he got home. Remember, he left around 12, 31 o'clock in the morning. He got home after moving his cars at the Canton Police Department. He got home, never made any phone calls, never received any phone calls. And here's where Alan Jackson shows him the records, which show that he did receive and make a call from and to Brian Albert at 2.22 in the morning. So remember, he received a call from Brian Albert for one second in which Brian Higgins called him back for about 22 seconds. And isn't it interesting that at 2.22 is when you these, these phone calls, 2.22 in the morning, when these phone calls went back and forth between you, Brian Higgins, and Brian Albert, and at 2.27, according to the defendant's Celebrate report, that's when Jennifer McCabe searched how long to die in cold? And he asked him, <laughs> and he keeps doing this, Alan Jackson, which is cute. Uh, some people may find it annoying, but I, I think it's, 
it's a it's an interesting interesting way of dealing with certain things. Uh, he asked him, "Did you lie at a previous hearing?" And his response was, "Of course not." And then he said, "Well, would you tell us if you did?" <laughs> so it's like one of those trap type of questions. Would I tell you if I lied in a different proceeding? It's you. There's no way to answer that question properly. So it was objected to, and he didn't answer that question. All right. Then what Alan Jackson wanted to do is that he's tr trying to show that this there was a 22 second phone call. According to the Celebrate report, according to the cell phone extraction, there was a 22-second phone call that Brian Higgins called back Brian Albert. Again, so Brian Albert called Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning for one second. Brian Higgins then called him back at 2.22, that called him back a few seconds later, for 22 seconds. And Alan Jackson was trying to bring out, 22 seconds is a long enough time to have a conversation, isn't it? And he wanted, what Alan Jackson wanted to do, with the court's permission, he wanted to just wait for 22 seconds in the courtroom, just with silence. And he wanted to say, okay, we're going to wait now 22 seconds, and we're going to see how long exactly that time is. And he's going to look at his watch and just time 22 seconds in silence. And that silence would be deafening. It would seem like three minutes. And that's why he wanted to do that, and the judge did not allow him to do that. Now, will he do that in closing argument? Certainly a good idea to say to the jury, if you think 22 seconds is not long enough to make a phone call, we're going to wait right now 22 seconds and then just wait. And it's going to seem like forever. And he said, that's the, type of phone, that's the type of phone call that Brian Higgins made to Brian Albert that night at 2.22 in the morning. And then he asked him, he asked Brian Higgins, okay, so it's 22 seconds long enough to have a conversation? And he, Brian Higgins answered, no, it's not long enough to have a conversation. That was not the right answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> of course, it's enough. You can have a quick conversation in 22 seconds. Call someone up and say, hey, meet me outside. Or, hey, everything's done. Goodbye. Or, he's lying in the front, in the front yard. He should be dead in a few seconds. Bye. I mean, it's obviously enough time to have a conversation. Um, but he fought, against, he fought against this, and he said no, which was, obviously, he looks like a liar now. And he also said previously that it could have been a butt dial. But in a previous hearing, in a different hearing, he testified, and the question was, did you call him back at 2.22 in the morning? So here we have, he was confronted with these records at a different hearing, and he was asked, did you call Brian Albert back? And his response was, yes. So here you're saying that you did call him back. And then you said, it's possible, this is what Brian Higgins said, it's possible that the phone picked up on the other end, but nobody said anything, so I terminated the call. So there he's saying it is possible that I called Brian Albert, and I just hung up because nobody said anything for 22 seconds. That's what his testimony was. Not that he never made that phone call. In today's, in today's trial, he said, I never made that phone call. Or he doesn't recall making the phone call. So again, not looking so great about that phone call. Now, According to his testimony, on the morning of January 29th, he spoke to Brian Albert and went over to 34 Fairview. And at that time, he also acknowledged that he could have spoken to Brian Albert and the whole gang there without any police enforcement there. And that's what Alan Jackson brought out. You all could have got together and decided what your story is going to be. He also spoke to Chief Berkowitz. Now, he asked him, did you tell Chief Berkowitz that you went to 34 Fairview that you were parked a few feet away from the body that uh, from the body where John O'Keefe's body was found. Did you tell it all to Chief Berkowitz? No. And did you tell him that you were flirting with John O'Keefe's girlfriend a few weeks before? No, you didn't tell him that either, right? And did you tell him that she that his girlfriend ignored you at the waterfall and that may make you upset at John O'Keefe? No. Did you tell him that you spoke to Brian Albert at two twenty-two in the morning? And of course he said no because he didn't speak. Um, all right, so, but he brought out all those things, that the things that he did not tell Chief Berkowitz, which would have implicated him in this crime. And obviously, to show the jury that you were not, just being forthcoming with this. And then he also said that no one from law enforcement ever asked to look at your Jeep. Isn't that right? And that's also true. Now, the morning of the meeting, when he had with the Alberts and the McCabes, so... After that meeting that he had with the Alberts and the McCabes at 34 Fairview, 
he goes to the Canton Police Department and he previously testified on direct examination that he may have gone to the Canton Police Department, but he also may have gone home. He's not sure. Now, Alan Jackson showed him records where they have key card access in the Canton Police Department. And in that key access log, it shows him all day in Canton Police Department, keying in of different places, in this room, in that room, in the Sally Port, out of the Sally Port. He's having, having, showing his digital print uh, fingerprint in the Canton Police Department all day. So number one, don't tell me that you're not sure whether you were in the Canton Police Department or, or at home. You were very clearly there, and you were there for a lot of the day. It wasn't like, oh, I'm not sure. Maybe I stopped by there for two minutes or not. You were there for most of the day, weren't you? And he was. That's what the key card access shows. He also spoke to Kevin Albert at 3.10 p.m. for 12 minutes on that day. Doesn't remember what it's about. Brian Higgins doesn't remember what it's about. He also, Brian Albert spoke to him two minutes after that phone call he had with Kevin Albert. And the suggestion here is, is that you're all getting together. You were, you were hearing from Kevin Albert what's going on with the investigation, and you were telling Brian Albert about it. That's what his suggestion to, uh, about what was going on here. And also what's interesting is that at, he was all around the Sally Port. Now remember, the Sally Port is where Karen Reed's vehicle ended up. And the records were that Karen Reed's um, vehicle was delivered there at 5.36 p.m. And the last key card access that... Uh, that uh, Brian Higgins had was about 4 p.m. to the Sally Port. And he asked him, were you doing anything funny in the Sally Port? And he said no. So that's uh, just uh, another thing. And it's interesting that there was no surveillance of when Karen Reed's car came in to the Sally Port. He asked him, where were you when her car came in? Now, he wasn't interviewed until February 3rd, again, by Michael Proctor. wasn't interviewed until a few days later. And it wasn't at the Canton Police Department. And this is something that interesting that came out, is that he wanted to say where it was, where he did get interviewed, but the judge didn't allow it. So that was just leaving us all hanging. I wonder where that interview actually occurred and why Alan Jackson wanted to get that information in. The judge didn't allow it in, but the judge did allow it in that it was not done at the Canton Police Department. And then all of a sudden on February 4th, Chief, Ber Chief Berkowitz calls you and tells you that he found some tail light at 34 Fairview. Now, in the federal grand jury proceedings, Brian Higgins testified that Brian Higgins called Brian Albert to tell him what Chief Berkowitz told Brian Higgins, meaning Chief Berkowitz tells Brian Higgins, I found tail light there. Then you testified in the federal grand jury that you told Brian Albert that. And now he's testifying that, no, I didn't. That's not what happened. Actually, what happened was that Brian Albert also called me and told me about the tail light. I didn't tell anybody about the tail light. And then in the federal grand jury, he also said, listen, I didn't do anything wrong in this. When he was being questioned in the federal grand jury, he kept saying, listen, I didn't, he didn't keep saying, but he did say at one point, listen, I didn't do anything wrong here. And here Alan Jackson is saying, why are you getting so defensive? I didn't do anything wrong. And he said, well, I thought they were being accusatory. Now what was interesting is that he actually, how did he actually get these text messages to the police department? He didn't turn over his phone and let them do a full extraction. What he did was he called his good buddy, his good friend, Matt Kelsch, who is an expert in phones distraction, who works for the FBI, or maybe he doesn't work for the FBI, he works at ATF, he is some sort of federal job, and he calls him how to extract certain uh, threads, and he goes into an FBI kiosk on the first floor of this building where he's able to have access to, and he downloads and extracts these two threads, the threads that he had with John O'Keefe and the threads that he had with Karen Reed, and he turned them over himself to the Canton Police Department. That's so nice of him to turn it over in that way to go through that process. Now, there's a federal statute that says that you're not allowed to access federal uh, access to do these type of things for personal gain. And here is where Alan Jackson was suggesting that he was actually guilty of violating this federal statute. And then eventually he said, you threw that car, you threw that phone away, didn't you? And you destroyed that SIM card. Isn't that convenient? Wouldn't that be helpful for this investigation for you not to do that? And then he said, well, I, I had every right to do that. And here he's sounding defensive. He's like, well, I had every right to destroy my phone and destroy the SIM card. And he said, well, September 30th, 2022, and we've heard this before in testimony, there was a court order that no one is allowed, 
including Brian Higgins, no one is allowed to alter their phone. And he said, but you, a day before, conveniently, somehow you may have found out about this order coming down, and a day before you decided to change carriers on your phone and to change your phone number. Isn't that interesting? And, and then eventually he kept the phone until October when the motion was denied, and that's when he destroyed his SIM card and destroyed his phone. So it doesn't look so great for Brian Higgins by doing that. Um, so that is where the cross-examination concluded on day 17, and we will hear more of the cross-examination on Tuesday. Well, that's it for now. Please, if you haven't, please subscribe, like, and we will see you next time.